respect is built up over thousands of decisions from who you helped across the street to did I cheat on my taxes? Did I do X, Y, and Z? And that's how you garner respect over time. And you look and you see like, what color is my jar? Hello everyone, welcome back to the Vertical Business Podcast. Uh, today we're gonna do something a little bit different because we've had a bunch of questions piling up from viewers and folks that have asked us in person after listening to some episodes. And those questions, um, well, some of them have uh, have similarities or the same question gets asked a bunch of times. And so we wrote down a couple of those and we just wanted to try going through uh, that list. We'll pick out some probably sort of at random that we think are most interesting. And we're gonna answer those for you today. So we'll, we'll try to do this kind of rapid fire, yeah. um, keep it as tight as possible. And just what comes to mind, we're, we're not really prepared like normal, but um, hopefully we can keep it interesting. Yeah, so. a, little, a little more off the cuff today, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's right. Okay, so uh, the first one that we get probably more than any other question is how do you allocate your time? Hmm. Okay. So would this be in perspective of like during the workday, during my like, like business, how do I allocate my business time? Yeah, yes. The, the, the question that we get asked most often is how do you structure your day essentially Yeah. so that time, time gets used most effectively if yeah. you're a business owner and you have all the other stuff going on as well. Yeah, okay, so I would, you want me to answer that one or do you wanna take a crack at it? Um, you can, yeah, you can take a crack at it. Okay, I'll, I will say for one, I think, just right out of the gate, my approach to time is that I value time a lot. So, cause we all work with people that are, they don't necessarily like, they feel like there's just unending time in the day. And I feel like I get a lot more done in an eight hour period than a lot of people I know mm -hmm. over a 12 hour period. I've heard you say that. Yeah, because I just, I work very intensely and I work very focused and I'm very, I'm very conscientious about my time management. So that's, that's just one thing I want to say. So the value of time needs to be high. Now, how I, how I spend my day and how I, how I focus on or how I arrange the, my, the allocation of time in my day is I believe for me that most of the best energy I have is between eight and noon. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I try to get up and I, and especially when I had leg work, cause I had, a, I had more going on than I do now, yeah. but I would, I, I put my, um, I put my reading time and time with the Lord in the morning around between like around seven or eight. And then I would, I would get my gym workout in actually in at the, either between eight, uh, eight and nine, which is counterintuitive to some people yeah, or between 12 and one. So I would do, depending on the day and what I had going, I liked the eight or nine because it gave me energy for the day. Mm. And I believe that the amount of energy you have, the, the intensity that you can work at is really, really critical. Okay. Versus just being like on a, like, you know, lethargic, you know, brain fog, it, those are not effective hours. So I would front load my day with that. And I, and I put my most important meetings and the most important work that I have, I try to do between eight and noon. Because what I find for me is, is I find the afternoon is less effective and the people that even I want to interact with, vendors, maybe on the East Coast, the day is getting later and longer and people are getting more tired. So I don't, I, any meeting that I find to be critical or mission critical or needs to be creative, I always, always put in the morning. Hmm. And then I, I reserve, and then, I, and then again, if I haven't worked out already, I will work out from 12 to one to try to get that energy boost. Reset. Yeah, get that reset, get a little bit of the lunch calorie, lull, sleepiness out. And by the way, I always eat light lunches. Do not eat, do not go have Mexican food for lunch, right? <laughs> Take it and then take a nap. And then take a nap. <laughs> like stay light, sushi, salads, smoothies, things like that. Have that be your lunch. And then if you need to go work out or at least get a walk around the block and then do task oriented things that don't require creative involvement or collaborative meetings in the mm. afternoon. And then that's the time I would spend doing what I would say like is my work. And I, and, and that is like catch up stuff on, on emails. If I've got, if I want to review a cash flow model and I want to sit there and pick away at it and, and think through different, you know, 
different scenarios, things like that. I use that afternoon hour for that. Mm. And, and again, I'll even have like a midday walk. So all important critical things in the morning, less critical things in the afternoon. And then I never, ever, ever do an important meeting on Friday after 12. I literally won't even schedule it because I will not be my best. Mm -hmm. So, and then, and the person attending probably won't care as much either because of that, right. Just the nature of that time. Yep. And so I'm working with intensity in the morning. I do things that require less intensity, that intensity in the afternoon. And then I try to be good about getting out at five and then giving my, my time to my wife, my church, those kind of things, uh, uh, with as much structure as I can. Okay. I think you answered that well. I don't think I need to. Okay throw anything in there that's, that's my day at least okay i'm very similar just so everyone knows i mean some small deviations but i, f- I feel like that's effective personally okay okay next question how many things can i do well mm. this is a good one i i've been asked this myself as well multiple times Be- yeah yeah. And I've asked this of myself. <laughs> yeah. I think it's a really good question. Guys get way strung out. Yes, they do. And yeah, I've heard you say, I've heard you talk previously about like um, the level of excellence or the level of singularity, the level of dedication it takes to really, really be awesome. Like Michael Jordan was a good basketball player. He's the best basketball player ever. And he was a marginal golfer mm-hmm. and he was a mediocre baseball guy. He couldn't do it all well. So I, I just kind of hurt you right. on that, you know? Yeah. No, that's a good, that's you a know? good example. Alex Honold, Honold, you know, scaled. Lives in a van and right. all he does is climb every single right. day. He doesn't play golf. He climbs El Cap with no ropes, Yep. you know? Well, that's how I feel personally. My answer to this question would be very few things or far, far less than you would, you would imagine. Right. Um, yeah. For me wanting to excel in business, um, while still having my number one priority be my relationship with the Lord and my relationship with my wife to try to fit in excellence in business. Because let me tell you, their business is the most competitive, is the most competitive game out there. There's nothing more competitive than the world of business. There's so much on the line. Um, It's more competitive than the most competitive sport, in my opinion. Yeah. Agreed. And so there are guys that don't have families and don't care. I mean, take like an Elon Musk as an example. There are guys in every industry that you're competing against like Elon Musk that work hundred plus hour work weeks. I know many of them. Mm -hmm. Um, And for many of us, we've lived a season like that or we go through seasons like that. So the point is to um, be able to truly be the best um, at anything or to be, not even be the best, just to be exceptional, to be in the top X percent, you know, um, it takes crazy dedication because there's other people giving it everything they have. So it's really a prideful thing, honestly, at the end of the day, to think that you're going to step into an arena that somebody gives their all 110% every single day, that you're going to step in with 25% of yourself and, and, be able to give it your best. And if something is worth doing, it's worth doing well. And I feel like that's a principle to live by. It is a good saying. And for me, yeah, I really want to do everything I, I am doing really, really well. And so I feel like based on everything we just said, that means if I want to do that, I just have to narrow, I just have to narrow the scope. And so personally, I'm focusing on my family and my relationship with the Lord and my business. And a lot of stuff from my youth is starting to fall away. I'm in my twenties and you know, I I had a lot of hobbies, I had a lot of friends and like a lot of that, I'm just, it's, it's kind of just falling away by default. Um, I don't have the capacity to care as much about those things or be as passionate about them because I'm putting more of myself into those, those three areas of focus. So yeah, the answer good. to the question is very few in yeah. my opinion. I think you have to start by deciding what, what do you care about? Yes. Like, what do you care about and what do you want to do well? Yep. Okay. And, 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 and for most of us, we can, we can name that. And then you have to just be realistic with like, probably to your, to, to your, your point, there's probably a much smaller circle that you can draw around 
you know, like if you put them all on a piece of paper, how many can you how, draw the circle around? How many can you do well? And if you're honest with yourself, it's going to be two or three things. Yes. Because if you have a wife and kids and you have a business and you have a faith, you know, if, if you're, if you're involved in your church, like I just don't know how guys can do that and also just be awesome at like skiing and snowmobiling and fishing and hunting and the guy that's good at everything. The guy is just like, it just, or, or, or be passionate about all those things and give them all a bunch of time. So I love your answer. I think it's, it's tighter than what we all want to admit. Yeah. If you want to be awesome at something, you want to really do well with those things that God's put in your life. That's a good final word on that. Yeah. Yep. Okay. What's the, I'll ask this one. I see this one in from on the list. Uh, I, this is such a, this one gets asked a lot. We could probably do a whole episode on this one, but I'll ask you this one. Um, I'm struggling to find purpose in my life. Mm-hmm. How do I find purpose? Yeah. Definitely a question that gets asked a lot. Yeah. I think in this particular season of, or, or the generations that are coming up are struggling with purpose. Yeah. Yeah. Lo- yeah. Let's, l- let's definitely just point out like, um, this is a, this is a, I think the symptoms of the fact that this is a hard time to find purpose are lots of the social agendas and the, the, the things that seem to be propping up out of nowhere as all of a sudden being these like brand new, super important things that people are fervently defending. Um, and it's, I think they're, they're a false replacement for the purpose that we've, or the places we've found purpose pre this last 20 years. Mm. Um, and so for starters, I think it, it, it is a really hard time. And so this is a really good question as a result of that. Um, and yeah, when I think about how to find purpose, um, for me, for one, you have to figure out what you care about. Um, and if you can't think of something you care about, I think that's, I think that's kind of a weak answer because frankly, because right now there's a ton to care about and, um, there's, there's, there's plenty out there. So I think you need to get outside of your get off social small media. world of t- TikTok videos and, you know, sitting on the couch. It's hard to care about things when you're living in that, that kind of a state. And so, um, focus on consuming over or focus on producing over consuming. Mm. Um, when you're in that consuming state, I feel like it's just hard to care about a lot. Put yourself in a, in a producing kind of state, which means like a producer would, instead of watching a YouTube video, make a YouTube video that's helpful for people. Just like throw out a random example. Um, so I think that's a good place to put yourself in to find something that you care about. Also, it's kind of counterintuitive to what I just said, um, but consume a lot of books. And again, I would say try to produce more than you consume, but read on lots of things, learn about lots of things. This is a good way to like try out lots of taste lots of different things all at once, try different genres of books and read on different subjects and figure out what piques your interest. And I think that's a good way to find things that you care about. And then once you find something that you care about, um, then it's like, well, how do I, how do I then pick something that, um, affects that thing and is worth doing for a long time and putting a lot of effort into. Mm. And I think then the only way that I can think of or that I have seen that works for people and has worked for me is to just like start taking steps forward, start moving. I I feel like pastor Josh has had, uh, has had some kind of version of this that I've heard from stage, which is like, well, you can't walk through a door or find an open door or a closed door. If you're sitting down, (laughs) like you're not going to run up against anything. So the point the meta point there is that you won't know where God is trying to steer you. Um, there's no point in a rudder if you're not, if there's no propulsion or you're not moving forward. So you just need to start working, trying things, just 
just get out there and 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 make an effort work hard at something and for me i've found like my path to business everybody has it was probably not what you'd imagine. I started by thinking I wanted to go to nursing school and I went to college and then I, and then I figured out while I was there, I didn't like it. So I dropped out. I got a job in sales, which led to learning about software, which led to learning about the business of software, which learned, led me to learn that I like business. And then even since I've started my first business, it's just been this journey and it's all happened um, not because I exactly had a plan to be where I'm at right now, but I have found immense purpose where I'm at because I just started moving forward and I, and, and I've leaned on and trusted in God. I literally have a tattoo on my arm, Proverbs three, five through six, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean out on your own understanding and he'll make your paths straight. And, um, I've leaned on the Lord as I'm doing that. And I feel like he's opened doors and I've found myself in a spot where I feel like I couldn't have any more, any more purpose than I feel like I have right now. Mm. So I don't know if that was clear, yeah, but that's good. <clears throat> I think in this generation, um, you know, uh, good times make for soft men, hard times, you know, make for Yes. Whatever that saying is. Yeah, yeah. That saying that's been circulated around the internet. Yeah. I mean, and and I think it's real. I think there's a generational, the societal issue with purpose right now because we've had such affluent times for the last, you know, 20, 30 years, generally speaking. And so the need to get out of bed and care about something is low because the milk will be in the fridge and the food will be in the cabinets, and the money probably will be in the bank account because you'll be taken care of. And there hasn't, if you're an American, there hasn't been any sense of threat to our, our, our land. Any, nobody would dare invade the U.S., up, you know, as of lots and lots of yeah, decades no, no now. Yeah, no war. Right. And so the sense of purpose is low because, the, because there is no need to necessarily be to get out of bed in the morning, like life will just take care of it. And so for us, that driving sense of purpose does come from our faith. And it comes from knowing that if, if you are on this planet and you are breathing air and your heart is being, is beating, Jesus has given you a purpose, whether you want one or not. Mm -hmm. And that is to live for him and to see others find salvation. And so the ultimate sense of purpose there is is knowing that I have a, a savior who has given me a mission. And if I'm reading my Bible right and I'm caring about the right things, you can't not have a purpose. It's been given to you. Mm-hmm. And if you care about it, then you should lean into that. So just on a even maybe even one more meta level higher. Yep. Um, there's the there's the faith and spiritual side of it. Well, I think the reason that those other things give you purpose as a, as a man, um, is because, you know, war, being a protector, being a provider, um, the kind of, like I mentioned the traditional pillars that were kind of lacking and, and now (laughs) stuff has taken its place. Mm -hmm. It's kind of popped up over the last 20 years. Those, I think the only reason that we find purpose in those pillars is because it's got, it's a blessing that comes from God's God's design. You're leaning into what God built you to do as a man. And because you lean into it, you feel the blessing of having purpose. Yeah. And that's a byproduct of being obedient to the Lord. Right. So yeah, the level above that would be yeah. everything you just mentioned. Spiritual level. <clears throat> Let's see. Um, this is an interesting one. How do I get respect in business and life? Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. We all want respect. Yeah. You want to, you want me to take this one or you want to? Yeah. Well, do you have thoughts? I do. I've got thoughts, but unless you got thoughts. Oh, you riff on it. <laughs> okay. I just talked a long time on the last one. So, well, I, I think that, um, well, for starts, let's, let's, um, let's break down respect and that, and the emotion and the desire to have respect. Cause let, let, there's, there's a, there's a, a healthy version of that. And then there's an unhealthy version of it. <clears throat> if your need for respect is being driven by the desire, f- um, for attention, or it's being driven by pride or it's be driven by ego, or you want to find yourself having status and position that you have not yet earned in life 
then you are out of bounds in in and that 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 desire for respect is being perverted or it's being twisted mm. okay so <clears throat> you got the 18 year old who's you know who's like i didn't want to be respected you know and like or or you're you know you want to be respected in the locker room in your first year of football you're a freshman you're one maybe you're a buck 20 mm. and you're like i want res- I, I really want to be respected as a football player it's like bro you haven't earned it and you're, you're out of you're out of place you're not going to get it mm-hmm Okay, so there's an unhealthy version of respect. But if you genuinely desire respect for the purposes of like, I want to do better in my business, I want to help my church, and I want to be a better leader in, in my circles, and, and, and everybody knows intuitively, you know you do need respect being respected is a, is a good thing. It's a good thing, exactly. Like the example you just gave, it's okay to aspire to want to be respected. I mean, right. it's okay to aspire to want to be oh, a respected 100%. linebacker. <laughs> and that's why I draw that line. Yep. Let's talk about the right kind of respect and why it's good. Yep. And so respect is absolutely a good thing. And if you're ever going to be a good leader and you're going to lead people into doing good things, you have to be respected. I mean, you literally did an episode on the best kind or the, the highest tier of leadership, right? And, it, right. and essentially it boils down to res- exactly. being respected. Exactly. That's literally exactly what it boils down to. And so you have have to have respect and so let's just talk about how do you get it yeah garnering Unfor- respect yeah garnering respect is do being excellent at something in in production and in character mm-hmm. for a very long time and the amount that you are excellent and the amount of character you have reduces inversely the equation of how long you need to do it to have respect mm. okay so if you're, if it's a, if you're, if let's say you're not that awesome at, 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 at many things in life, I would say this about myself. Like, I don't have like a superpower. I don't, I don't not like really awesome at any one thing. And so for me, like trying to earn respect or trying to garner respect is just, is just like slow and steady and like do something, be a man of integrity, work hard and do it well for a long time. And then people will slowly start to respect you and say, Jeff or Caleb or whoever will do what they say they're going to do. And that's not sexy. It's not going to end up on a, on a a viral social media post for, you know, like being this hero or whatever, but you can garner respect by doing a good job and being a man of your word and doing what you say you're going to do and getting out of bed and going and doing your job and pulling your boots, your, your bootstraps up and just doing it and doing it well for a long time. And you'll garner respect. In every context you live in, whether it's in your church, whether it's in your business, whether it's in your in your marriage, doing what you say you're going to do for your wife and your kids and being consistent, you'll get respect from your wife. And so, again, but it, it, conversely, if you, or not conversely, but again, if you're super excellent at something, you don't have to do it for as long and the world will start respecting you. Like Alex mm. Honnold may have never climbed a mountain in his life. When he, sur- when he summited El Cap with no ropes, I respect him, mm. whether I ever knew he climbed or not. Yeah. Right? Right. <laughs> but the formula is the same. It's just how long it takes you to get there. Mm. Yeah, that's good. So there's no instant gratification in, in garnering respect. Right. It, but there's some quicker paths. Right. But and, for and, the everyday person. And don't think you can cheat the system. I know a lot of people who want respect and they continually break trust. They continually don't think people are looking and they don't think people are paying attention to them when they're when they're doing disrespectful things. Mm. And then they erode they erode their respect level and, and then you never like, get Why away with that. respect me. You never get away with that. Right. Yeah. It always comes back. I mean, it's not karma is not the right word, but it it yeah. it, it it always comes to the surface. <laughs> There's I, always justice in that. I area. would use the the example that I've used with with you as kids. Yeah, and that is, is that good. respect is like a is like a, a a jar of sand. And every time you do something good, you put you drop in one white grain of sand. And every time you do something you're not proud of or causes disrespect, you put in a red grain of sand. And and it takes a long, long time to fill your jar up with sand with all of the micro moments of life Mm -hmm. all of the small decisions all of the little things that you do day after day every interaction with a person every everything that comes out of you as a human being you are dropping grains of sand in there and in 10 years what color is your sand is it pretty white 
is it look like a jar that people look and go, that's respectful. I like that guy. Or is it pretty dark red mm-hmm. or is it, or is it kind of pink? And, and that, and, and so it's like respect is built up over thousands of decisions from who you helped across the street to, did I cheat on my taxes? Did I do X, Y, and Z? And that's how you garner respect over time. And you look and you see like, what color is my jar? So. Yeah. I like that one. I, since you told that to me, it's, it's, majorly stuck with me yeah yeah good how do i judge my family or sorry not how do i judge (laughs) how do i judge my family don't ask that question how do i juggle my family and my work or my business yeah i like work-life balance kind of question I think. yeah work-life balance kind of question yeah i have a i have I'll take this one. I have an answer for it. And it, it, and it's actually more an observation. I'm going to call this out um, from what I've seen you do and that I've implemented personally. And I think you would probably have the same answer to um, this question. But when it comes to family, for me, <laughs> right now, I just have my, my, my scope is my wife and then my immediate family. So I I don't have kids yet. Um, but I think this, this applies because I saw it apply for you and what I've, what I've seen. So I'll I'll say, I'll use you and Becky as the example first is that you have always invited the family in general. So Becky, and then also us kids. So that's, I guess how it applies to kids, um, into, the business and into the work that you're doing. And you've done that by sharing, um, what's going on. Uh, you know, not just coming home and just locking up. Um, I think you, you, you share well about what, what you're doing and then also inviting us in to participate so that, and, and calling us into that. And I, I think that that's good for many reasons. Um, and you know, like, I liked that actually as a kid where that might seem counterintuitive because I I feel like we got called into being a part of something bigger than ourselves. And so that actually was really fun. Mm -hmm. Um, you, cause you might wonder like, Oh, how are my kids going to take me asking them to participate, participate in the business? Um, rather than just goofing off all the time, I think it's actually really good for them. So I enjoyed it. And then also what it did. And then I've seen specifically has happened for you and, and mom, for you and Becky, is that it facilitates a great relationship um, even when work hours might be more extensive than they are for somebody with a nine to five because, uh, again, you get to have this shared vision and this shared purpose. And so your your family, and in, in this example, I guess specifically your wife, is on the same page with you. And then in conjunction with that, because they're on the same page page with you and they're seeing what's going on day to day and they're being called into that, they also have perspective on how much you have going on. And right. so for the what I've out, I've applied that in my life because I saw you do it and I've done it with my wife Jamie. And I've seen since the beginning of our marriage an increasing um actually an encouragement from Jamie on on work hours when she knows I'm under the gun and I have a lot going on. She knows how many people I hold responsibility for employees and investors and ourselves, the list goes on and on. And she's actually super supportive and supports me in that. Mm. And so, you know, that makes it a whole lot easier to juggle when you, you mesh the two. Yeah. So I'm, what I'm hearing in that is like the key to work-life balance is, is having a, uh, is communication and having Mm -hmm. a a highly connected relationship and a, and a highly communicative relationship with your wife and your family. So that instead of just grabbing your lunchbox and marching off to this nebulous, you know, black hole that's called work yep. or the office um, every day, you, that could, if, if they don't know what's going on and you come home and you just shut down and you're tired and you're kind of the grumpy classic, you know, image of a, of a working man who comes home and takes a nap and yep. doesn't talk to the family. Um, if that's the case, you're going to have a hard time. You're going to have, you're going to be fighting jealousy between this, this black hole that's called work and your wife. Right. And she's going to be jealous over that. But if you involve them 
and they're and you're communicating to them, and especially if it's a business, if it's if if you're if you've converted your business into a kingdom business, into a kingdom outpost, now you have this joint effort to like serve the Lord with your business, with your wife. She's drawn into that. Becky used to love to engage our staff and bring in, do muffin Mondays, bring in treats for the staff and love on them. And she would do all the events and, and things like that and became this joint effort. Now there's no tug between between what is my work-life balance. It's like, well, it's all blended. It's integrated. Yeah, even since Muffin Mondays, I mean, she's just increasingly become more and more involved, right? I right. mean, I feel oh, like she's... 100% almost equals, you know, in, yes. in some of our businesses. Right. Yeah. As our kids have gotten older and she's been able to lean in more and more, it's been incredibly helpful to have her. At, and like, she's just on wanted the team. that. Right? right. Right. And she's wanted it. She sees the vision. She gets it. She understands. So yeah. um, I think to your point, high level of communication is the best way to juggle work-life balance. Because if they don't know what you're doing, all they're going to do is just be jealous about what they don't know about. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're at 30 minutes. Oh, wow. Do okay. we want, do we want, we have lots of questions, yeah. so we could do this again. Um, or we could hit an, we could hit maybe one more. What do you think? Let's, let's do, let's do one or two quick ones. Okay. Yeah. How do I find the confidence to be a leader? It's mm. a good one. Yeah. Okay. That is a good one. People lack, lack, a lot of people lack the confidence and willingness to step out and lead. And, and I think there's a lot of people that have the aptitude to do it and don't and end up not doing it. Right. Mm-hmm. So I don't know if you have an answer for this, but I have a quick one that comes to mind. But yeah, if you want to take shoot it, shoot the quick just, one. Okay, Go ahead. the quick one is is the the confidence to be a leader is the the willingness to fail is directly tied mm. because if you're obsessed with what people think about you and you're worried about failing, you're gonna have a hard time getting out of gate. And my read on most people that are afraid to lead is because they're afraid to fail. They're mm. insecure. And so a willingness to say, and, and here, let me just say this. Here's the reality of almost all leaders I know. None of them actually know what the crap they're doing. <laughs> they're just willing <laughs> to go out and do it. Yep. They're willing to go out and fail. I know you feel this way. I felt this way. Every day uh, that, that you have a business you've never had before or a size of scale of a company you've never had before is a day you don't know what you're doing. You've yeah. never been here in this territory. You're always stepping through a door that you haven't been through before. <laughs> exactly. You're always stepping through a door you, you haven't been through before. So the, the, the ability to find confidence to be a leader is to get over yourself and to be okay with saying, I actually don't know. The best leaders I know when you talk to them in a closed door session is they're like, dude, I have no idea what I'm doing. Uh, so many leaders will say that, and they're, but they're figuring out as they go. So give yourself, have a little more, you know, give yourself a break and be willing to step out and lead and be okay with failing. Yeah, that's great. Well, okay, I'm gonna cut it off there. Okay. Uh, we got, again, we have tons of questions, so maybe we'll do this again sometime, but um, I think that's a good place to stop. Those are all great. Uh, if you guys wanna ask questions uh, of us for future episodes, you guys can put them in the comments or you can go to our website, gosparrow.com, and um, you guys can submit stuff there to us and maybe we'll answer it on a future episode. Thanks. Hey everybody, thanks for listening to the Vertical Business Podcast today. If you like what you heard, then go follow us and subscribe on YouTube, Spotify, X or Twitter and uh, Google Podcasts. And uh, if you want to interact with us beyond the Vertical Business Podcast, you're interested in all things business, go visit our website at gosparrow.com. You can get access to our newsletter and also interact with just more content than we put out here on the Vertical Business Podcast. So go check that out. Thanks.